recognizes that the Torah is given in a real physical world with laws of nature, laws of biology, laws of chemistry, and laws of gravity. If somebody goes to the 13th floor of a building and jumps, so there is a law of gravity and it has nothing to do with the Torah. The person may be liable for a law of Torah because the laws of nature led to something. So we need to know what are the laws of nature in this topic and we believe that there is nature and we will see both uh, Torah sources and I will call on psychological research. We need to discuss the psychological realities and then there is definitely a huge part of culture. Um, there's no question that uh, the culture in uh, biblical Israel or in temple Israel or in Eastern Europe in the 16th century or in the Af er North African Arab countries um, or today in Mexico or New York or uh, Los Angeles or London or Israel or Iran, there are cultural differences. So we're going to have to figure out how each of those influences affect us and what conclusions we should have because of that. So I want to start with Torah. So God created a world. And he created a world where he told us how the world is being created in the opening verses of the Torah. And when he created the human being, Zachar unikelva bara ota, that God created a male and a female. And the Kabbalistic literature discusses that in the context of Shamayim Va'aretz, Zachar Unikeva, not on a gender level, but on an influence level. When we say Reshit Bara Elohim, when God first created Shamayim Va'aretz, that is a metaphor for a source of resources that bestows those resources on a recipient of resources. So the Shamayim represents the heaven that bestows resources. It can be spiritual resources. It can be physical resources. Because the Shamayim, the source of rain, bestows the rain on the earth, on the Aretz. It is a recipient of those resources. And then it takes those resources and uses them to grow and to develop. So that is Shamayim Va'aretz. In the Kabbalistic literature, it's called Mashpia Umikabel, a bestower and a recipient. So when it says Zachar Unikeva Bara'otam, in English translation, it's male, female, but that's not the real meaning in, in, in the Hebrew, in the authentic uh, uh, biblical Hebrew. Zachar has a different meaning than just a man. Nikeva has many other meanings besides a woman. And conceptually, we talk about the male dimension being the mashpia, the bestower, and the female dimension being the recipient. Every human being has a, a dimension of bestowal and a dimension of being a recipient. God is viewed as the bestower. Man is viewed as a recipient. The Jewish people are viewed as a bestower of spiritual resources to the rest of the world and as a recipient. Every human being at times behaves as a bestower and at other times as a recipient. But the male gender, men, were created fundamentally as the foundation of the bestower and the woman as the foundation of the recipient. Now that becomes very, it could become very political. So therefore we will take it out of politics and turn it into a very simple understanding that despite all of the political um, uh, and sociological arguments about gender roles and gender equality, we still haven't changed the physiological, biological fact that the male role in reproduction is a bestower and the female role in reproduction is the recipient. The male bestows and he's finished. And then the, the female is the recipient of what the male bestowed and the female becomes the one that nurtures and grows that into life. Another principle, again from the Torah, 
is purposeful creation and that the one of the major purposes is to have continuity of the world. What we're driving at is that children, the next generation, is the most important thing from a Jewish perspective. From a secular perspective, power and money is the most important thing. But from a Jewish perspective, the next generation is the most important thing. Where men are more interested in things and women are more interested in people. Men are more interested in ideas. Women are more interested in relationships. Is that sound? Uh, 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 not, uh, what word am I looking for? Does that sound um, um, chauvinist? Does that sound chauvinistic? The research shows it. The research shows that it's not that the uh, engineering department of a company discriminates and says, no, we're going to keep the women out of the engineering department. And society says, we don't want women engineers. We only want women nurses. No. Engineering is about things. And men are more interested in things. So we would expect that there should be more engineers that are men than engineers that are women. And we should expect to find that there are more women in the nurturing professions not because there's a discrimination and not because there's some control issue, but because that's what women want to do. Women want to be involved with people, but all of the other things. Women are just as smart as men and in some areas of life much smarter than men. So what does it mean, nashim da'atan kalot? Da'at doesn't mean intelligence. Da'at means connection. Da'at means opinion. And what it says is women's opinions are much more flexible. A woman is likely to change her mind much more often than a man. Do you think that's true? Yes. If you don't, ask your husbands. <laughs> Men are viewed as very focused, stubborn. Another, they're into ideas. The, the Kabbalistic literature talks about that. Ihu emet, the man is, stands for truth. Truth means objective. And the woman is much more flexible. The woman is much more uh, uh, able to be different things. Now that has advantages and disadvantages. It can easily lead to what we call situational morality. You can make all kinds of excuses for different things, but you're also very flexible. A man is very stubborn. So what do we find now that we have 50, more than 50% of the women in law school and medical school and their lawyers and their doctors. Well, we find two things about women lawyers. First of all, you can predict based on gender of the lawyer whether a lawsuit is going to go to court or it's going to be settled out of court. Which way do you think it's going to go? Who's more likely to settle out of court? The lawyer who's a male or the lawyer who's a female? Can everybody agree on that? So that has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with brain power. It has to do with personality. Women are less into conflict than men. And again, there's a lot of sociology involved because every Jewish community ultimately makes sociological decisions. We have to know, A, is the decision based on halakha, in which case there's nothing to talk about because halakha is like a law of gravity. Is it based on science? We have to make sure we're up on this latest science and that the science is not politicized. I want to just show you how politicized science can be. I have an article from many, many years ago in the early years of brain studies when they were starting to realize that we can do brain scans. When I was in, uni in university, gender differences were studied by laboratory experiments. We showed a man um, a, a page of, 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 what, of, of, uh, of figures and a woman, and we see whether the male responds in one way, the female, it was called field dependence, field independence. When you have a gray circle inside of a white circle, and you have a gray circle inside of a black circle. So the gray is identical, but when you look at the two, they don't look the same. The gray circle in the white looks darker, then the gray circle in the black. Everybody's aware of this? Everybody's experienced that? That's called field dependence. So the primitive, primitive experiments that we were involved in showed 
that there was a gender difference between field dependence and field independence. Where has marriage stood steady? In what socioeconomic level are women getting married at the same rate they used to? And where are women getting married at a lower rate? That's what you would expect, but it's exactly the opposite. Women in the high socioeconomic, only rich women are getting married today. The poor women are not. Again, why that's true, you have, to, you have to read up the research because they interview why, but basically, they don't view marriage as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, some kind of a trap, but once they're wealthy, so then why would they spend more time on a career? They want to have a life, they want to have a relationship. But a woman who's poor, she has no choice. She, has no, she doesn't have the luxury of worrying about a relationship, she has to make sure that she can pay the electric bill. Interesting sociological observations. It's called, in, in the bigger, um, bigger world of, uh, of psychoeconomics, it's called the law of unintended consequences. We many times make a decision because we think something is going to happen and there's all kinds of other consequences that we don't, didn't think of. The law of unintended consequences. A lot of feminism has led to the law of unintended consequences in both directions.